It's good to be back with you. My family enjoyed a, a vacation. Uh, we met some extended family in Tennessee this week, which is not where I'm from, but we just all gathered there. It was quite beautiful, and we enjoyed it thoroughly, but we did miss you. I was thinking of you last Sunday, very grateful for Bart and his willingness to preach. I know he did an excellent job. I was able to listen to that message online this week, and I'm very grateful for him and grateful for you. I just wanted you to know that Obviously, I, I'm grateful for vacations and serving in other places on occasion, but um, it's always such a gift to come back to you, um, this church that is my home, that is our home together. Uh, there is a sense of returning home and everything feeling that it is as it should be when we're here together on Sunday. So thank you for the gift that that is. Um, if you would open your Bibles to this masterful book of Ephesians that I pray has been changing us, has been inspiring us, has been reshaping us as God's Word always should. We don't want to just be hearers of the Word. We want to be shaped by it, and whether that's a, a word directed to our lifestyle or a word directed to our thoughts about God or a word extolling the glories of the gospel. We, we want to be shaped by the good word that God has given to us. There's no exception to that this morning. We're going to be looking this morning at the end of chapter 4, uh, really the last two verses of chapter 4, but in order to, to establish the context and just remind us the overall theme that God, that, that Paul has been driving towards, I want to look back at a couple of verses earlier uh, in chapter 4. We remember that Paul explains in magnificent terms the work of the gospel in the first three chapters, and then uh, in the second half of those first three chapters, he, he focuses on the work of the gospel in creating a church, a church that will reveal God's glory in the world. It is God's great project on earth, displaying his gospel wisdom to the angelic realm. And he concludes chapter 3 in verse 20 of chapter 3 by saying, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is Paul's hope in light of God's purpose for the church that it would result in God's glory in all generations. And then he directs it specifically to the body in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And he continues from there. And then we reach uh, verse 17, where he becomes even more specific. And he says, now this I say, and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their understanding. And then he says in verse 22, that we're to put off, or we have put off in the gospel, our old self, which belongs to our former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And we're to be renewed in the spirit of our minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And then we have the excellent work Bart did last week in explaining the specific way we are to begin living differently, to put off old ways of life, to put on new ways of life. And this passage this morning is just a continuation of that same theme. Uh, in verse 30, after he talks about the tongue, Paul puts an emphatic warning, a sobering reminder. In verse 30, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, which I think applies to speech and by implication all of these habits. It's Paul's reminder that God himself and the person of his spirit is among us, and to speak, and by implication to walk as the Gentiles do, is grieving to that spirit. That the Spirit is watching over His church and is grieved when the people of the gospel walk according to the world. He's, he's motivating them and saying, don't, don't speak the way the world speaks. Speak the way the gospel inclines you to speak. And act the way the gospel inclines you to act. You, you would not want to grieve the Spirit that has been given to you as a deposit of your redemption. You're headed to heaven, and the Spirit guarantees that future. Don't walk in a way that would grieve that Spirit, Paul says. And that seems to bring to Paul's mind a particularly grievous way in which we could walk according to the flesh in a particularly privileged way. We can reveal our gospel identity. 
That's our passage this morning, verse 31 and 32. Let's read it together. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. When I was in school for ministry training, we had a, a man there uh, that became a friend. He was from Russia, and he would tell the most amazing stories about life that he experienced and some of the uh, physical difficulties, um, aspects of, of life in, in certain where, places he had lived. And one of the stories he told that, that frankly, the class just found astonishing to be, he, he, he was he was supposed to go and lead a some sort of a Bible study at a house. And very much in keeping with his temperament and personality, before the uh, Bible class started, he was outside. And I had the impression it was very cold, but he's outside walking around and praying. He's a very serious-minded guy. And he's walking around and praying outside in advance of leading this Bible study. And then he, he realizes, I, I have to go to the bathroom. And he's, he's seriously preparing for this Bible study. And then he, he notices that there's an outhouse, an old outhouse. And he says, well, I'll just use that. I won't have to go back in. I can kind of continue my preparations out here. <laughs> so he walks. It must have been dark at night, I guess. He's walking toward the outhouse. Well, un, unknown to him, someone had moved the outhouse uh, away from its original spot. And I'm not familiar with that houses, but I know that's bad. <laughs> that's bad when you do that because if it's dark, uh, the outhouse doesn't go nowhere. There's no plumbing. There's just a place where everything goes. And so he's walking toward the outhouse, probably still to spirit of prayer, and he fell uh, into the hole where the outhouse had been. And, and now he is covered literally in stench. And he now has a problem because he has to lead a meeting <laughs> and he is covered with stench. Well, he, he made the, in my opinion, totally appropriate decision. He walked in his stenchiness uh, to the door, knocked, and just directed someone else to take over the meeting. And he went home and he said, I, I, I vigorously, I mean, it was a vigorous attempts, repeated attempts to remove this stench from me. Now, I have no idea what goes into an ancient outhouse Hole, but it's bad, okay? So he, he was vigorously, we could understand, trying, because he knew that that kind of stench uh, would have no place in a, in a Bible study, in a place that, that would ruin the entire meeting. The whole point of the meeting, focus on God, would be distracted because we're going to be focusing on this person and their stench, right? Well, isn't that much like what Paul is saying here? There is a kind of sewage, there is a kind of stench that is present, not outside of us, but inside of us in our old nature, our old man. And Paul would say, uh, there's nothing more offensive than the sewage of the old nature that still exists. It clings to us in spite of our new identity in the gospel, and it has no place. It actually is offensive to our calling to be covered in the stench of our old nature. It must be put away, Paul is saying. Don't walk as the Gentiles do. As, as obvious as it would be to us that you can't just walk into a meeting after a disastrous encounter like that with an outhouse. In the same way, Paul would say, in a greater way, you, you cannot exist in your identity in the gospel and compromise with lingering sewage of the flesh that still clings to you. Why? Well, because our identity in the gospel is revealed by relational affection. Our identity in the gospel is revealed by relational affection. The goal of our relationships, even, is to reveal our gospel identity. 
That's the goal. So, so what Paul is saying is, if the goal of our relationships is not primarily our personal comfort or our personal sense of connection with other people or, or even our, our sense of well-being all the time, that the goal, the ultimate purpose of our relationships, he says earlier in this book, is, 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 is to reveal or reflect or give evidence to the nature of identity in the gospel, and our, our old identity has no place in that reflection. And the emphasis here is on our, our personal interactions, our personal relationships with others, that the, the glory of the gospel is at stake when Christians relate to one another. The display of the gospel identity is at stake. According to the calling, he says at the beginning of, of, of chapter 4, and it, it leads all the way down to this specific example. Your calling in the gospel is revealed by your relationship with other people. My calling in Christ Jesus is given evidence as I relate to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's showcased. And so, of course, the sewage of self and antagonism has no place. Like Paul often does, he talks about the category that should be put off from us and the category that should be put on to us. So there's two points this morning. First, be cleansed of antagonism. Be cleansed of antagonism. I like that word antagonism because I think it just summarizes all of these. this list that Paul puts forward. It's being anti someone else. It's being opposed to them. There's an emphasis on anger here. Antagonism. I am anti you in some particular moment. And Paul says that must be put away from us. Let's look at this list, this antagonistic list. And, 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 and remember, Paul is saying that these things are part of our old flesh. They are natural to our old flesh. You don't have to make any special effort uh, to be this way. They are natural to us, but they have been mortified in Christ, and they are to be continually mortified and put away from us, cleansed from us in an ongoing way in the life of the Christian. Now, first thing we want to notice about this list is the comprehensive language Paul uses. Notice that Paul says, let all, all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander. There's comprehensiveness in the word all, and also in the fact that he lists so many different examples of antagonism, so as to remove any loophole from any Christian that some kinds of antagonism might be understandable it might be legitimate in the life of the gospel community. He's trying to be as comprehensive as he can, both in the all language and in the listing of all different kinds of antagonism. Let all bitterness, he says. Bitterness has this idea of a, a demeanor of heart that retains hard thoughts toward another person. A demeanor of heart that retains hard thoughts towards another person, either because of their sin against us or because they are an obstacle to our desires. We can be bitter towards their sin. We can be bitter towards their weakness. It's the holding of grudges, the lack of forgiveness, the tendency to meditate on the shortfall of another. The disillusionment that comes from seeing another person's hypocrisy and holding that against them. The readiness to see a person's sin in the way you expect them to. Bitterness, Paul says, must be put away. Be cleansed of bitterness. Wrath, possibly wrath as distinguished from anger, might be an, an, an outburst, a spontaneous outburst of anger, which I experience I, don't you? I, I experience this when I'm driving. I experience this with my children at times. I experience this when I'm surprised by a an observation someone makes of me that catches me off guard, and I, I'm just spontaneously angry. This happened the other night. I was I was hearing we were my wife and I were talking about an observation that someone uh, had made of me, and there's just this moment of, of anger in my heart, kind of a self righteous. Hey, don't they know what a great person I am? 
how ridiculous it is to share this kind of observation. And there's just anger there. Another time I was sitting at the table, this is recent, and my, I was hearing uh, a comment, an observation, very, very sweet observation that one of my children made. Hey, Daddy, I think you have something on your face. And for some reason, it just struck me as unnecessary. And I just kind of said, I don't need to worry about that right now. And my wife came later and said, that's even a kind of extreme reaction. Well, I'm proud, and so I'm prone to extreme reactions. Wrath, anger. These are the kinds of things that, that, that come out of us and, and settle us against someone. When we feel our reputation or our peace or our desires are threatened, we react in anger. When I'm trying to be on time somewhere and someone has gotten in the way, I, I can react in anger towards that person. Paul says, be cleansed. Be cleansed. Be cleansed of these things. He goes on to clamor. Clamor, uh, the, the clearest thing that came to mind here was those moments when, when little children just start arguing and it just escalates. It's louder. No, you didn't. And yes, you did. And Paul says adult Christians can be guilty of that. There's no place for clamor in the gospel community where there's this sort of bickering and, and back and forth. I, I did. No, yes, you did. I know I didn't. No clamoring, no, no murmuring in the gospel community, Paul says. That's, that's filthy. It's the, it's the flesh. It's the way the world works. The kind of bickering that you see on, on daytime television shows and, and, and you see in, in the midst of, 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 of celebrity spats that go back and forth on Twitter. This kind of clamor that happens. He says there's, there's no place for that in the church and it can creep into the church. You see little arguments that happen that seem to become clamorous on Facebook and there's a, there's a spat that goes back and forth. No, it didn't. Yes, it did. Or the kind of innocent discussion that leads into an angry, clamorous discussion. Paul says, no, there's, there's no place for that. Be cleansed of this. It's your former way of life. You can see this in married couples where you have a, a, a simple conversation and for some reason there's an offense that happens and, and gradually the clamor increases. I think we need to see this from God's perspective. What does he see? Is two children clamorous towards one another. No, dear. Yes, honey. There's a clamor that's happening and ascends to heaven and God says it stinks. Not in the church. Not among my people. Be cleansed, he says. I wanted to make a point about clamor, about being easily offended. I think this is such a need for watchfulness in the church, that we not be easily offended or easily given to argument. Neither easily offended nor Easily ready to argue. I know that's a temptation for, for many of us, that we can be ready to argue or easily offended. Quick to perceive slights or offenses in others. And it can result in a clamor, a dispute in our heart. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon, this well-illustrated point. He says, little pots soon boil over. And I have known some professing Christians who are such very little pots that the smallest fire has made them boil over when you never meant anything to hurt their feelings. They have been terribly hurt. The simplest remark has been taken as an insult and a construction put upon things that never was intended. And they make their brethren offenders for a word or for half a word, I or even for not saying a word. Let us not be such little pots that soon boil over, easily offended. I remember having a, a conflict with my wife one time. My wife is the object of most of my anger. I was thinking this week, I was like, man, almost all my illustrations are my poor wife where I've responded in anger to her, her observation or, or just living life with our kids or whatever. And I was remembering a time when, when she pointed out, you're, you're taking the worst possible interpretation of what I said. 
I said that, but that's the worst interpretation of what I said. I was being a little pot. <laughs> it's such a good, humbling description. You little pot, boil over at the slightest thing or even the lack of something. You perceive the slightest insult to your reputation or your dignity or your pride. You boil over. How dare you say that thing to me? Be cleansed, Paul says. Slander. Continues to slander. Slander is the act of defaming. The word is used for a blasphemy in the Old Testament, so it might reference cursing. I think it also would include any kind of defamation of a person's character, an attempt to, to undermine their reputation. Any attempt to undermine the reputation of another Christian. Any attempt to undermine the reputation of another Christian. Paul says, be cleansed of this. And you know and I know this is devastating the church and of particular temptation when the internet renders all of our speech global. The tongue that could quickly become a forest fire now can become a forest fire around the world. In less than three lines. I'm not against social media, but this is a massive temptation that anybody that is on social media needs to take very seriously. I, I take advantage of social media. I think it'd be used for the gospel. I think it's used for relationships. I think it's a gift, but with that gift comes a great temptation, and slander is one of them. To send or or to receive the defamation of another Christian. Facebook is not a Bible-free zone. It must be a Bible-exalting zone. It's the act of vilifying another or abusing them with our language. It might cover harsh language. It certainly would cover defamation of another Christian. Charles Spurgeon says, Do not be ready to receive such reports. There is much wickedness in believing a lie as in telling it, if we are always ready to believe it. There would be no slanderers if there were no receivers and believers of slander. For when there is no demand for an article, there are no producers of it. And if we will not believe evil reports, the talebearer will be discouraged and leave off his evil trade. One way I've been convicted recently about not guarding against slander in my own life is the way that I will choose to read highlights about popular figures in the world. It might be a movie star, or this you know person's happening, or this happened with this person's life, or I mean it's just pervasive in the culture, right? I mean you look at any kind of news, there's some headline about this person or that person, and I, I I'll read those, I'll see them, I'll see those headlines, and I thought you know that's probably doling my sense of conscience about the evil of slander. I've justified it by thinking, well, they, they want the popularity. They probably like having even negative press as good press. I thought, well, who cares what they want? The point is, I should be sensitive to slander as to sewage. Certainly any slander that I would give towards others, I should count as a work of the flesh. Continuing about receiving slander, Jonathan Edwards, the pastor, says, there are always two sides to every story, and it is generally wise. Let me make this a pastoral appeal into the future of our church and in your relationships. It is generally wise and safe and charitable I don't think this quote is wrong. <laughs> the hope, he says, is to take the best. And yet there is probably no one way in which persons are so liable to be wrong as in presuming the worst is true. There is no one way in which persons are most liable to be wrong as in presuming the worst is true and in forming and expressing their judgment of others and of their actions without waiting, without waiting, until the truth 
is known, without waiting until the truth is known. Let me encourage us in an attempt to put away, be cleansed of the works of antagonism, that we would wait until the truth is known, that we would believe the best of one another. Take the best interpretation. Take the most gracious interpretation. Wait until the truth is known. Do not let the first telling of a story affect you or influence you towards someone else. The proverb says, the one who states his case seems right until another arises to question him. Slander is pervasive in our culture. It is devastating to the church. It is a work of the flesh, and we must be cleansed from it. All sewage of antagonism must be cleansed from the church. In order to be completely comprehensive, Paul ends this section by saying, with every form of malice, every form of malice, there is no compromising with the sewage of antagonism. No compromise. He says, be cleansed. Let no particle of it remain, no smear of it remain, no vestige of it remain. Be cleansed. Your gospel identity and its revelation is at stake. Your gospel identity is revealed in affection towards others, not in antagonism towards others. My gospel calling is shown in its worthiness by the cleansing that takes place of this kind of antagonism. No bitterness, no wrath, no anger, no clamor, no slander, with all forms of malice. Now, my friend, I am sure, would not settle for a partial cleansing. Neither should the Christian settle for a partial cleansing of antagonism. Make no compromise with the sewage of personal antagonism. Now, I am, I am quick to smell the sewage of antagonism in others. I notice the lifted eyebrow, even. I notice the slightly harsher tone of voice. But I am dull to the sin of antagonism in my own heart. We need to be most offended when that antagonism is still present in us. And the good news of this is that this antagonism has been paid for at the cross. It has been crucified in Christ. It has been cleansed permanently from us in our record because Jesus bled for it there on the tree. And in him, we can now walk in the washing of his blood that continues in the life and practice of a Christian. We can enjoy living in freedom from the stench and sewage of antagonism that is present in our hearts in a lingering fashion, but that Paul says should be put away from us. Make no compromise with the sewage of personal antagonism. Where do you smell it right now in your heart? Is it towards your wife, towards your husband, towards a child, towards a friend, towards a relative? Where is it? Where is it right now? Right now? Maybe it's justifiable because they stink too. Paul says, be cleansed. Be cleansed. No one covered in filth decides to remain that way because they look at others and see the same thing on them. Go. Let it be put away from you. The grammar here is in the, the passive voice. I, I think possibly it, it's Paul wanting to accent the fact that the Holy Spirit is at work doing this. He is at work. He, his, his passion is to cleanse our life. And so there's this willingness to receive his work, to respond to his conviction. There's this openness to say, yes, cleanse me, Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness be taken away from me. No habits of clamor, no slander, no small vestige of anger. Let it be cleansed. Let me be convicted of this as convicted and responsive as I would be physically responsive if I fell in that hole. This is coming out of my heart. Let it be cleansed. I want none of that. Let us be far more convicted that this sewage comes out of our heart than we are offended when it comes out of others' mouths towards us. 
Make no compromise. Jonathan Edwards says, A Christian should at all times keep a strong guard against everything that tends to overthrow or corrupt or undermine a spirit of love. That which hinders love to men, listen to this, listen to this, I found this to be pastorally true in my own life and the lives of others. That which hinders love to men will hinder the exercise of love to God. It will. It will not be limited to that one area. A lack of love towards a person will eventually creep into and defile our love towards God himself. For, he says, as was observed before, the principle of a truly Christian love is one. That means it's all connected. Surely those things which overthrow love are exceedingly unbecoming Christians. An envious Christian? A malicious Christian? A cold and hard-hearted Christian? is the greatest absurdity and contradiction. It is as if one should speak of a dark brightness or a false truth. Spurgeon issues a stern warning. You are no lover of Christ if you do not love his children. As soon as ever the heart is given to the master of the house, it is given to the children of the house. Love Christ, and you will soon love all that love him. Be cleansed. I want my heart to be cleansed. I want my heart to be offended because I'm often not offended by this sin. I create a layer of justifying protection, mostly blaming other people. And I cease to be offended. I want to be offended by this sin. Gives evidence of the old man, that old identity that's been discarded at the cross. I want to give evidence of the new identity made and created new in Christ Jesus, the sacrificial loving Savior. That's what I, I want. That's what we should want. Point number two, be clothed with affection. Be cleansed of antagonism. Be clothed with affection. Be clothed with affection. Let it be your raiment. Let it be present wherever you are. Let it be on you all the time, Paul says. Put on. Put on. There's, there's something to put on. Very important that we see this. I was, I was just speaking to one of my kids about this uh, today, actually, where it's tempting. It's tempting, especially for Western Christians, to think of the Christian life primarily or even exclusively in terms of the avoidance of negative sins. That's called the sin of commission. Things you should not do that you do. Active sin. So anger, slander, maliciousness, bitterness, all that stuff. Don't do that. But to stop at neutral is to fall short of God's purpose for our life. It's, it's not as though there's this normal train of Christian life that just avoids these kinds of negative maliciousness, bitterness, slander, all this kind of stuff. And this is the normal mode of the Christian. And then if you want to be a super duper mature saint, you can move over to this side and take on the extra package and be kind and loving and tenderhearted and compassionate and forgiving. But, but that's really for the super saints. Everybody else, as long as you're avoiding the negative sewage, you just hear uh, without you know, any concern or problem that you're, that you're doing damage to the gospel reputation. Paul says, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And imagine how, how true that would be in a marriage. Imagine if every Valentine's Day, a husband goes to his wife and says, I don't hate you. I don't hate you. God love that. Oh, it would be ridiculous. Imagine if that was year after year. How are we doing? I don't hate my wife. Good. I remember a story one time, this was a long time ago, not in this church, different church, but of a, it was close to Valentine's Day and there was a, a group of people that were, were talking together and the leader encourage the other people in the church or the group to to encourage let's let's encourage their their wife let's encourage their wife let's go around and encourage our wife 
And <laughs> this, this one individual, I, I think was, it was well intended, but it was just one of those moments where what he said uh, <laughs> did not have the effect. He, he was trying to say, you've really grown in humility, which would have been a much better way to say it. What he actually said was something more like, uh, you just learned how bad you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's what actually came out of his mouth was something like that. And the leader went afterward and said, Bro, I don't I don't think that was actually a blessing at all. <laughs> but isn't that true of Christians? Settle for neutral, call it good. What is your identity? Are you in neutral? Are you in Christ? What's your identity as a Christian? Are you in neutral? We know we're not in sin. Are you in neutral? Or are you in Christ? Christians are in Christ. Christians have received a calling in Christ. Who is Christ? Christ, the one who gave himself to save sinners, who laid down his life for others, who treated our antagonism with affection, who treated our defiance with forgiveness. That's the Christ we're in. That's our new identity. A neutral Christian life does not display the Christian identity. It does not. It falls short. It goes nowhere. But you are not in neutral. You and I are in Christ. That means our identity should reveal him. It should reveal our gospel identity. That's the whole point that flows out of that first verse of chapter 4. Let, let the worthiness of your calling be displayed. Not the lack of your old life, the presence of a new life. Put on, he says, affection. Put it on. There's something to do. There's a proactive calling that reveals the glory of our new gospel identity. Our relationships reveal our gospel identity. We are desiring for our gospel identity to be revealed. We are not merely desiring to be in neutral. We are desiring for our gospel identity in Christ Jesus, the loving sacrificial servant, for that to be revealed in every encounter with the fellow Christian. Put on affection. Paul, again, lists a number of, of words to, to draw this out. He says, what does he say? Be kind to one another. Kindness has this idea of, of treating with goodness those in our life, desiring to be a blessing. It harkens back to the Old Testament where God had kindness towards his stubborn and rebellious people. It brings to mind the graciousness with which God treated those, even when they didn't deserve it. It's determination to be good to those who are not good to you all the time. Again, not neutral. Be kind, he says. He says, be tender-hearted. What a wonderful word. Tender-hearted might be translated compassionate. It has this idea of of loving a person in their weakness, wanting to help them in their weakness. What a contrast to my typical response of, of being bugged by a person's weaknesses. God sees weaknesses and it compels him towards people. Not in condescension, but, but in a desire to help and to serve and to, to lift up and to benefit and to provide. And he says, oh, look, there's a weakness. I, I'm, I'm toward you in that. That reveals a gospel identity. It reveals that we've been remade in the image of our creator and redeemer. We've been remade in the image of Christ. And if we're remade in the image of Christ, we should look like Christ. We should look like him, this desire to lift up the downtrodden, to help the broken, to, to see any personal cost as the privilege of an expenditure to pay for someone else's needs. We should see ourselves and our calling in the Good Samaritan, the ultimate Good Samaritan, who sees this needy person on the side of the road, who cancels his plans and pays his own money to lift them up and to carry them to safety. This is 
what reveals our identity in the gospel of Christ. It showcases it. And we look back at earlier chapters, it reveals the wisdom of God to the angelic world when the church functions as the church. And so again, as I've said before, this little moment you have of disrupting your planned evening to spend some time caring for a needy brother and sister, it is showcasing the wisdom of God to the angelic powers. It is no mere momentary inconvenience. It is a cosmic display. The choice to go to this meeting to build up that brother or sister that has been in a, a weary moment and, and needs you to just come in and say, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. I'm here with you. I know this is hard, but I am with you. With you in this when you would rather have stayed home because you're tired and exhausted and it's a long day that choice that positive choice displays that you are in Christ because only a person in Christ would do that not a person that's in selfishness and not a person that's in neutral only a person that's in Christ would leave the comfort of some kind of home and go out to serve and lay down their life for someone else what's happening when you choose to say I don't feel like doing this for them but I will anyway what's happening Heaven is seeing a display of God's wisdom in the gospel and the power that Jesus Christ has to transform selfish sinners to loving servants. Incredible opportunity. Tenderhearted, he says. He caps it off with forgiveness, maybe the hardest thing to do. Forgiving each other, he says. To, to forgive is to decide to no longer count this person's sins against them. Though they have sinned against you, you choose to love them anyway and not hold their sin over their head as a barrier in the relationship. It's to say, I, I put that sin aside. I no longer treat you as your sins deserve. I love you rather than being wrathful towards you in your sin. I draw near to you rather than being distant from you. Forgiveness is acting like God did in the gospel, which is precisely why he gives this motive as God in Christ has forgiven you. What a motive! Consider that God in Christ has forgiven us. He has paid for our sins. We who were defiant towards him, he didn't allow us to remain at a distance. He kept drawing near to us. He loved us. He approached us in the person of his son. He paid the debt himself. He died for my selfishness towards him so that he could draw near to me. He took my pride and arrogance and he nailed it to himself in the person of his son on the cross. He put all of my sin upon him so that my guilt would be borne away into that tomb. And then he says, come and draw near to me, you former rebel, and I will embrace you and bring you into my family one day. That's the gospel that is your new identity, Paul says. This gospel of forgiveness from God himself through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, a, a sacrificial forgiveness, no one understands how hard it is to forgive more than Jesus Christ. It's hard to forgive. It feels vulnerable. It feels dangerous. It is heart to not hold that sin against them. To refuse to love again. To refuse to desire their good again. To hold them permanently at a distance. No. 
again, there are occasions of sin where wisdom needs to be exercised. Let me just insert this caveat. Obviously, there's things like abuse and so forth. I'm not just saying we just person just ignore, just forgive and move. No, there's there's safety and wisdom, and I'm not saying you just run back to this dangerous situation. Obviously, there's wisdom to be involved there, but the heart should be disposed to forgive even in that kind of situation. And certainly for many of us, and for most, the vast majority of the sins we experience are not in that category. They are in the category of commonplace sins that we experience from one Christian to another, and from one family member to another, commonplace sins of pride and selfishness and, and self-focus and, and, and harsh speech and these kinds of moments that... that Paul says, if you want to reveal, you have an opportunity to reveal your gospel identity and to forgive and love this person who has sinned against you. I love how real this is. It gives a sense of comfort to know Paul knows that Christians have sinned against other Christians. He creates a thing for Christians to do in response. It's not a surprise. My situation of being sinned against is not a surprise to God. Your situation of being sinned against is not a surprise to God. He knew it would happen, and he created a thing for us to do, even when we were sinned against, that can display our gospel identity. Forgive as God in Christ has forgiven you. He's talking about forgiveness there, but I think by implication, <clears throat> that connection to the gospel, it really flows out into every aspect of our treatment of another. We go to the gospel, gaze at what God has done in Christ in order to receive our motivation and our example for how we relate to others. Christ is first Savior, and we don't replace what he does towards others. But secondly and truly, he is also our example. And the ethic of the New Testament is largely live up to the person that has saved you. Reflect in your, your own individual way the great work that he did in saving you. We never replace that work. We don't be a savior to others. But we do reflect him. And that's the privilege of it. We love as Christ loved us. We forgive as Christ forgave us. We are kind as Christ was kind toward us. The more we know of the gospel, the more reason and example we have for what it looks like to love this person that is hard to love. True love loves the unlovely and the unloving. True love Gospel love doesn't just love the loving. True love, gospel love, loves the unloving and the unlovely. Where is a person unloving or unlovely in your life right now? Think of a name. It might be me. Some way. It might be a family member, it might be a, a member of the church, it might be a relative, unlovely or unloving. True love, gospel love, loves the unlovely and the unloving. What does this mean? It means that when you experience a moment of unlovely or unloving, it is a necessary opportunity for you to reveal your gospel identity. Necessary. The gospel identity is not revealed when we only love the loving. The assurance that we have when by the Spirit we are able to love the unlovely or the unloving is that God himself has done a work in us to renew us after the image of the one who died to pay for our own sinful unlovingness and unloveliness. Be clothed, Paul says. 
with affection, kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Relationships are our opportunity to reveal the gospel. They are our opportunity to do so. We have the opportunity to reveal what Jesus has done to save us. People are not obstacles. They are opportunities. Being sinned against. Not an obstacle, it's an opportunity. Think of it as the only way you can reveal that Jesus Christ saved you in a relationship is when that relationship becomes hard. Marvelous promise is that in loving, in affection, in graciousness, we are declaring and revealing our gospel identity. We are showcasing the work of the gospel in our soul to God and to the world. Every act of difficult love is an act of worship towards God. I know this is really hard to do. It's not hard to think about doing, and it's not hard to chuckle about how hard it is to do, but actually doing it is really, really hard. Much easier to give the silent treatment for a week or a month or a year or a decade. Much easier to shout and blame. Much easier to snicker much easier to come up with a perfect argument and defense in our minds that we launch future occasion. Much easier to denigrate and slander this person in our minds. But glorious to love. Glorious to be compassionate. Glorious to reveal that what Jesus did to save us has changed us and has given us the glorious calling of revealing that work by loving one another. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, I pray that you would Give us the joy of your salvation. And I thank you for forgiving us of all of our sin. Lord, I pray you would comfort with your forgiveness anyone who is convicted of a lack of love. Lord, you love even those who don't love. You forgive even those who find it so hard to forgive. We thank you for that, Lord. I pray where there is conviction and repentance that you would bring restoration and reconciliation where appropriate. Lord, I pray that there would be a, a brokenhearted, desperate plea for your spirit to be at work. I pray you would cleanse us from all the sewage of the flesh, and you would clothe us with your own love towards us that we can extend that towards others. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>